What's up, peers, and welcome to join the Wasabikas, a Bitcoin privacy podcast. Today, I'm sitting down with Ruben Waterman from the awesome Bitcoin exchange Bitter that you can visit at getbitter.com. Uh, and he has a fascinating story of establishing a beautiful Bitcoin company uh, in Europe and then due to multiple reasons having to shut down that and for a year teaching himself how to code and hacking on the, the next version of Bitter. Uh, which is now up and running again in a different jurisdiction with a beautiful display of ju jurisdictional arbitrage uh, and how that all plays into the macro adoption of Bitcoin. So I'm super excited uh, to talk about this um, privacy focused uh, Bitcoin exchange today with him. Uh, and as you guys know, uh, you can listen to this podcast in a podcasting 2.0 enabled wallet. Find it at newpodcastingapps.com where you can toss us some sats, for example, Breeze, uh, and those go to all the amazing people uh, who make this show possible. And that includes Saxonet, the amazing editor who cuts out all the mistakes and the blabbering, uh, and people like Nubuntu doing the timestamps and Yegor doing the artwork, uh, amazing teamwork here. So uh, support the project. And without any further ado, uh, let's get into it. Ruben, how are you? Good morning. I'm good. How are you? I'm doing fantastic, especially when talking to you, as we have actually had in the past quite numerous podcasts uh, on different outlets. So I'm happy to catch up. Uh, but for, for those people who are uh, who are now hearing you for the first time, like, what is your kind of motivation to be contributing to this free and open source space in the Bitcoin world? Well, I I think that the financial system that we have it's past the point of like guys, let's fix it. So I prefer to uh, put my efforts and time into setting up a new parallel system um, with Bitcoin to hopefully one day replace the old legacy system. Yeah, that's the beautiful cypherpunk ethos. And right? let's write code. Let's build a program speech that is just secure in and of itself that cannot be broken. And then the consequences are inevitable. And eventually people will use the superior system. That's nice. Yep, that's the way. Cool. And so when you got into Bitcoin, what were some of the projects that you were initially looking at and maybe even contributing to? Um, it took me a while to actually do stuff in the space. So I've been uh, looking for a long time. I even did this um, online master's degree at a university to try and understand Bitcoin better. But uh, it was only during that studies that I was like, hey, maybe I can you know, do something because I was always using this uh, investment app called Acorns in the US it allows you to buy like small amounts of stocks and bonds and whatever. Um, and then I was like, why don't we have something like that for Bitcoin? Like you just like you don't care too much. You don't want to go through complicated stuff. You just want to buy a little bit uh, every now and then. And that's uh, that's where my active Bitcoin ju uh, journey started. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's that's really interesting, and I liked your approach uh, that you thought to yourself like, I, I, let's take an existingly useful application in the existing fiat system, and let's apply it to Bitcoin, uh, and let's see how it works and actually build it out. That's a great yeah. approach. And obviously, all that uh, that money that I put into that uh, app, I liquidated it and uh, and put it into Bitcoin because that was doing much better. <laughs> Oh yeah, that's the bane of every uh, like Bitcoin entrepreneur. You know, if your alternative is to save your wealth in a sound monetary asset that it's in its early adoption stage with a huge potential of number go up technology, you know, com compare that to the the risky investments, you know, of of building your own company and and giving away your precious stats to all types of people. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's yep. tricky. Yeah, I am thinking like, what what did I do before? Um... I, I don't know. I don't think I was even on Bitcoin Twitter. That was also like a thing I discovered much later. I was just like watching Andreas Antonopoulos videos mostly. Yeah, he is for sure one of those guiding poles that brings a lot of people in. Um, and you know, it's interesting that uh, if there are so many people in the space, uh, you know, that might not be active on Twitter or in other places, but are still building and contributing in a sense, like, like, like you did. And then great to, to meet up with these people and actually discover them that there is, there are more entrepreneurs fixing the problems in Bitcoin that you might've initially thought. That's quite a beautiful thing. 
Yeah, that's for sure. And it's actually one of my like real life friends that that back in that day was like, hey, you know, there's this Bitcoin conference. I know you're interested in Bitcoin. Like, go, let's go and meet some fellow Bitcoiners. And that to me was like this, like, ah, you know, there's so many more people like me and they're all on, on Twitter apparently. And that's like, you, you do need to kind of get this introduction from someone or through some podcast maybe. Um, yeah, because we should be welcoming more and more people to the space. Yeah, that is, that's absolutely for sure. So as I understand it, you have like in, initially very little experience with software and software development, uh, but then you recklessly decided to make your first startup, uh, basically a software company, right? Running this reckless Bitcoin exchange. Like what were the initial challenges with jumping into this new market for you? Oh, for sure. It was that I understood absolutely zero about software development. Like I had no clue uh before i started and um the initial version of uh bitter was actually built by an outsourcing company uh they're based in romania in Cluj. i went to visit them a few times and i was like oh yeah they actually look like legit guys they were they did not have experience with bitcoin but they were very keen to learn and yeah we we started off the journey we were building for about well i'd say eight months or so and and that was actually going well uh, for for I don't know maybe one two years, but then because they now had experience with Bitcoin, they were this like very popular company for software development because they were the guys that knew and they got very busy. They got a ton more projects. They at some point even built like a, an actual exchange, like with trading engine and whatnot. So they had less and less time for me, which is totally fine. I mean, I understand that that you, as a software developer, you want to work on stuff that excites you, not so much the, on stuff that's like uh, already built and it just needs to be maintained. And right about the same time, I, I unfortunately had to close Bitter in the Netherlands. And um, so, yeah, it kind of came nicely together that I was like, well, I'm kind of annoyed that when I want to do upgrades or when I want to implement new stuff, new stuff on bitter i'm always like dependent on other people and at the same time i had all this like spare time now now that i no longer had to operate a company so i was like you know like the whole back end it's written in elixir let me do some like starting courses on elixir and um, yeah i was doing that for about six weeks maybe two months and then i was like okay i think i got the hang of this and i i just like we had this huge backlog of things because we were always only doing the most important upgrades. And then I just like looked, looked at my backlog and I was like, oh, this issue, I think I can fix it. And um, yeah, just from one, one thing to the next, I now basically maintain the whole stack myself. And it's very liberating to be able to make the changes you need to make yourself. Yeah, that's such an interesting uh, journey, you know, and I wonder, let's, let's step down a bit and go through it step by step. Uh, initially, right? So you have this idea in mind, you have this vision of building this project, right? What were the different options that you thought were available for, you know, getting people involved to get the work done other than the one that you ended up choosing? So I did initially consider like, oh, maybe I can do this myself because I, I did like a little Python course at some point and I was like looking at my bank API and I was like doing some, some basic stuff. And I was like, ah, oh, okay. But I, I never trusted my own skills to, how do you say that? To build an actual exchange and deal with people's money, uh, with my very limited coding ability. So there was this route of doing it myself from the start, but I, I quickly said like, no, let's not do that. Um, I also looked at this website. I'm not sure. Maybe you know if it still exists, the btcfreelancer.com or xptfreelancer.com. I think I've stumbled upon it, but I never ended up using it. Was there any traction on it? There were some uh, projects there, but um, I, at the same time, I also looked at Upwork. And from both platforms, I had this issue of like, well, you're you're dealing with one individual. And if he or she decides to no longer work with you, you're kind of lost. Like you, you just have no backup plan. Right. So that was my, mm. my alternate, my other avenue that I 
ended up not using is like using one of these freelancer uh, platforms like uh, XPT Freelancer or Upwork. It was just too risky for me to to go and build a startup with with someone that's like not uh, vested in your company and they don't really have any long term alignment with you. Yeah, it's and tough. then it's tough, right? You, you you need to have somewhat of a rock star to take care of the initial part of a project right? to just bootstrap it. And yeah. you might have been the rock star on the, let's say, idea and the, the creative part and the, the vision and the business side, right? but not at all on the coding side, which is, of course, essential for a software startup. And so, no, no. Uh, and, uh, and for that, I'm, I'm still very, very thankful to uh, like the CTO of the development company I used. It's, uh, they're called Around25. His name is Cosmin. And he just did amazing work for, for Bidder in the early days. Like he had the whole like architecture laid out and yeah, all the like stuff that I actually today still wouldn't be able to do because you need like That's this great. experience of a, of a software developer. Yeah, for sure. I, I wonder, was that original software free and open source? The Bidder software? Yes. No, it's not like. I understand from your perspective that you would really like it to be, but at the same time, like it's um, like you're running a business. So if everyone were to be able to just, you know, spin up their own bidders, um, I, it is something that I crossed that crossed my mind when I closed down the business in Holland. I was like, you know, maybe I should just open source it all and then people can run their own bidder. Um, but for now, I'm still trying to run a profitable business and, uh, yeah, it maybe it's stupid, but I'm just too too afraid that other people would just be like, "Oh, kid clone, let's start a uh, another company called uh, Better or Butter or whatever," and, and start doing the same. Yeah, but uh, you know, there are many more things than just the software that you need to do in order to run a, a proper business like this, right? All the business connections, the bank accounts, and whatnot, the exchange accounts, and all that. So yeah, that's true. Th that's one side to the argument, right? And the other thing is like. You, you want to get people to build the software for you, right? And uh, w when you have a free and open source project, I mean, there is a chance, especially when you do a proper communications and marketing around it, that there are people going to come and contribute completely for free, right? And to actually help you out with very, very important issues to more or less of a degree of intensity. Uh, so I think that might have been a great solution, actually, to to get going and bootstrap and maybe find someone who's interested to build this software just so that it is out there. Yeah, that's 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 actually cool. Like if, and I, I'm not sure if I have the customer base, but from time to time I I do get feature requests, and I'm just like, well, you know, this would be nice, but I don't have the time. And it would be great if there's like some sort of a bitter community going on, where. Um, where then other people might be like, oh yeah, I would actually like that too and, and go out and build it. Exactly. That's the other thing, right? The feedback from people um, is, is great. And just GitHub has fostered this culture of great feedback and uh, the direct public way to process them. So I think that's, uh, that m would also be great, you know, to just know what your users actually want and for them to give easy ways to give feature requests and bug reports. Right? That yeah. ends up being a much superior software in the end. Yeah, there's also the other thing that um, now that I write quite a bit of the code myself, I'm also scared of putting it out in the open because I'm like, well, maybe I wrote it like really badly or like it's really ugly. And uh, and then everyone were to be able to see that. Whereas now from yeah. a customer perspective, it all, at least it seems like everything works and, and stuff. Yeah, that's for sure scary uh, to to make your work public. And as code of speech, it is never perfect, and there will always be bugs. Uh, so yeah, that's that's scary to kind of admit to, to to the faults, right? But on the other hand, if you don't publish them, then it's going to be much more difficult to find out about it, and especially for those people who would like to help you with fixing them. And that's one yeah. of the other cool things about free software is that many people, again, for free, provide a security review of your software just by looking into the code and, and pointing out where there are potential problems. And if these are communicated publicly and, you know, fixed early, then that again, leads to better software. Yep. Yeah, that's true. Food for thought.
Food for thought. So Bitter 2.0. Yeah. Is yeah. the code yet open source or will it soon be? <laughs> uh, it, it's not yet. Okay, but soon in two weeks, I hope. <laughs> two weeks, yes. <laughs> Cool. So, okay. So these were kind of your options initially to build the, the, the bidder software and you figured that out with, with the kind of um, freelance company. Um, yeah. So then how did you go about, for example, you know, the, the banking infrastructure? Um, so initially I was banking with a, a bank called Bunk in Holland and they are like to this day, from the fiat world, I think they're the best bank in the world. Like their whole infrastructure is kind of set up as this software company. And uh, actually the guy who founded the bank is, uh, he's, I'm, I think he's the former CEO of one of the largest hosting companies in Holland. And he has, he just has this completely different mentality of like, I'm going to build a software business, which happens to be a bank. And so integrating bitter with that bank was just a blessing like it was so easy and 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 just like a amazing performant api um whereas in today's bitter uh we are banked by a german bank and the cool thing about germany is that they have this like kind of well it's heavily centralized infrastructure but at least the the api for a german bank is always going to be the same so there's like one one system in Germany that every bank has to be compliant with. And that way you can like read out your banking transactions through an API. The problem is that the system is kind of designed in the nineties and it hasn't changed that much. So it's like not nearly as reliable as the uh, bank API. And it's also, there's like delays between transactions happening and transactions being published via the API. So you can notice that for them, this API is not a selling point. It's just something that they have to do. Whereas for Bunk, it really was a selling point. Like, hey, look, look at our API. Look, like there's also a ton of developers active on the Bunk forums to build like other little apps. So yeah, that's interesting. It's cool that some companies in the incumbent world actually start to embrace you know software in in the first place. And most of the yeah. old banking is is still done on paper. Uh, and then, you know, good software practices, uh, second, uh, that's encouraging. Yeah. Yeah. They're also, I mean, I guess it's uh, this bunk bank and Revolut and TransferWise that have like, you know, actually workable APIs. Um, and funny enough, bunk actually integrates, uh, TransferWise through the TransferWise API because bunk is like, well, you know, we could do foreign exchange ourselves, but TransferWise is just so much better at it. So why don't we give our customers um, the option to use TransferWise? And this kind of mentality, I liked it very much, but unfortunately they don't bank uh, Swiss companies. So I had to change. Yeah, and you see, I think current FinTech is more about fixing the UX of a broken system. <laughs> well, oh yes. T t true monetary innovation is happening in Bitcoin, you know, fixing the broken system per se. Yeah. Oh, I would love to. I mean, that would actually be super nice if one day Bunk reaches out to Bitter like, hey, uh, you know, you, you're doing Bitcoin stuff really well. Why don't why don't we integrate Bitter into our banking app? It would be so funny if like an actual mm -hmm. bank says like, oh, you know, we're doing Bitcoin stuff too, just to get more users on board. Exactly. I think that's coming and uh, Bitcoin provides so much space for banking. Uh, and, you know, exchanging shit coins for Bitcoin is just one of the many things that you can do as a bank. Uh, the the yep. options are truly limitless. Yep. Interesting. But uh, so in the original registration of the company account uh, at this Netherlands bank, but were there any issues? Were there any concerns when you told them this is a Bitcoin project? Oh, yes. Um, I then got the, the full compliance uh, uh, department, like... Uh, spitting into every little piece of the business and I had to disclose everything and um, yeah, you know, the whole shebang of like uh, AML KYC policy and all this stuff. And the whole process took like another, well, six months or so just to open oh, an wow. account, right? Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. yeah. Did you have similar experience with just creating the company? No, creating a company is always easy. Like. Uh, the government never really cares what you do with a company, right? It's you just uh, 
you fill out the application form and that's that like the company is created the problem is always getting a bank account mm -hmm. yeah there you see just how much of the censorship is applied not on the government level per se when registering for a company right but on the financial infrastructure layer uh, which is something as basic as receiving a bank account uh, and signing up for that is yeah impossible literally impossible for many many people uh, and companies and of course being a bitcoin focused project is just one of the oppressed minorities here yeah and we're still seeing the same actually today with the swiss entity that uh, we've been so we incorporated in september i think from November onwards, we're trying to get a Swiss bank account and so far have been unable to. And the only account that we got was like uh, an account with PostFinance, which is kind of like this, I don't know, it's not state run, but it used to be. And so their condition was like, we can give you an account, but you cannot use it for trading. So we cannot receive like customer deposits on that. We can just use it, you know, to pay salaries, to pay rent. Um, yeah, that's it basically. So here, here we are, we get a bank account, but it's conditional, right? Like it's not like any other business that, yeah, here's your bank account and do whatever with it, what you want. We get this bank account and we get told what to do with it and what not to. Yeah, that's incredible. And it just prevents so much innovation that might have been possible here, right? There's a lot of uh, hindrances and blockages artificially put in the way to make innovation at least bloody difficult again if not impossible yeah and it's that's also really shitty of like this current environment that um if you want to you know let's say you have a simple idea and it somehow revolves around bitcoin it's just so hard to get started um yeah with all the the legal fees getting a bank account it's not it's not like we're in this um uh, dot com bubble where you can you know you just register a company and you try stuff like no because you touch the financial system it's like it's nearly impossible for like small players to to get started and to try stuff so it took you over six months to get your bank account how long did it take you to generate a new address in your bitcoin wallet uh like one nanosecond maybe <laughs> <laughs> oops <laughs> that's yeah. not great oh yes yeah, that's so nice. Actually, also like with the the guys from uh, Bitter uses mainly Kraken to do uh, the, the the trading for our customers, and the difference between a bank and Kraken is just already like a 10x improvement. Like, yeah, it still takes time because they have their compliance department, but from opening a bank account in six months to opening a Kraken account in one week is like wow. Yeah, we're making improvements and now as you said like creating then a bitcoin address just one second that's even better but we still need to get people there so that's why i like to be in this space of exchanging dirty shit coins for bitcoin uh, for sure a very valuable temporary service hopefully <laughs> hopefully very temporary i would be happy to be like in 10 years like oh or even five years oh my business is redundant that's great <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I mean, they, they won't stop printing shit coins anytime soon. So you will have to continue to be the waste <laughs> disposal facility. Yep. So you, you mentioned that uh, you used Kraken. Why did you end up choosing them or, or what was the criteria and the alternatives? Uh, I think uh, even though from time to time, I still get shill messages on Telegram or, uh, or via emails to use other exchanges. I realistically think there's only two options in Europe, which is either Bitstamp or Kraken, just because they're the uh, like the largest in volume for the Euro BTC market. I guess I could also take a look at Coinbase Pro, but I really don't want to work with Coinbase. No. Um, so yeah, and then it's kind of weird, but even though Kraken is also a bit of a shitcoin casino and more, I get like an email every week, like, oh, now we've added this token. And every time it makes me like, ah, why are you guys still so focused on this? Yeah. Um, but I don't know. I, I still have a better feeling with Kraken than Bitstamp. Yeah, that's true. And I'm, I'm curious because Kraken is not really made for, you know, DCA, it still has not implemented it for whatever reason. But I'm, I'm wondering, like, 
what how, how is your transaction structure actually at Kraken? Like, do you batch, for example? Oh yeah. So um, I check the um, Bitter Bank account every hour, and then I accumulate all the new transactions that came in. I place a buy order at market rate, so I, like I, my customers are literally getting the the exchange rate that they would be getting on Kraken, uh, and then um, from my own Bitcoin wallet, I pay out the amount that I just bought on Kraken, right? So um, I don't like first withdraw that money to my own wallet and then go send it out. I just use like a temporary balance from Bitter to pay out my customers to make it a bit more efficient. And then once a day, I withdraw my balance from Kraken to my own node. I see. That's very interesting. Uh, so here, of course, to point out, right, this is your you're batching at least uh, all the customer transactions in every hour, but still, you know, making a purchase every hour means that they're rather small trades, right? Instead of lump sum trades. Uh, yeah. Is there like, for example, a trade-off in fees that you need to pay for the brokerage? No, I could actually do it in a, in a bit different structure where, uh, like, because at Kraken, uh, you don't really pay a fee per trade. You only pay a percentage. So I could actually buy, like, let's say my customer, they transfer 25 euro. That's the minimum at bidder. I could actually, as soon as I see that transaction, I could buy the 25 euros um, and then, like, let's say, send it out maybe once an hour. Uh, so there's not really a restriction on, on that end, which is nice. The only restriction is there, of course, when you withdraw the Bitcoin, where you pay that, I don't know, is it like maybe 15,000 Satoshis fixed fee? Um, so that one you want to avoid, but other than that, all the costs are variable. I see. That's great. And then kind of the other thing that you arbitrage is the custodianship risk, right? So you have then Bitcoin held custodially in the Kraken exchange uh, or money warehouse of the Kraken exchange, and you pay out your customers instantly out of your own self custodial wallet into their address of choice. Uh, so yeah. here for that period in between the, the withdrawals out of the Kraken money warehouse, you have the custodianship risk that maybe Kraken goes bust. That's right. So that I try to keep to a minimum in comparison to the rest of the, the bidder balance, of course. But yeah, just, just, I mean, I could, I guess I could withdraw after every purchase, but that would bite into the bidder fee quite heavily. Because for example, on the, on the 25 euro uh, deposits from customers, I barely make any money, but I just want to make it available to people. Um, so I think, what is it? The revenue on those transactions is 28 cents. But from that 28, I need to pay 20 cents to my bank for just receiving that money. Oh. And I also have the Kraken trading fee, which is, I mean, it's not that high, but it's another few cents. So there's probably like four or five cents left for me, but I'm okay with that. Like I'm, I'm happy to have people dollar cost average 25 euros a week or whatever. Uh, it gets them off zero and yeah. Exactly, that's at least something. And of course, the other very point worth highlighting is that you're almost non-custodial or let's say the custodianship is limited to a very, very short time period, right? So a person sends you 25 bucks on, uh, on the banking system and then it might be one hour until you check. Um, that the new payment arrived, right? But yeah. as soon as you find that out, you make that payment uh, to the address of the customer. So you yeah. basically only have an account system for roughly that one hour. Yeah, it's it's always like 60 minutes at max, which I, I feel very comfortable with as well. Like, you know, if um, I had some statistics for the, uh, the previous bidder, and I think by the, uh, by the time I shut down, I converted for about 6 million euros worth of Bitcoin. And I was oh. like, well, imagine like being a somewhat custodial platform where at some point part of that is like your liability. I would be like, oh, like right now I still have, as you said, I have some money in, in Kraken, which is like, you know, I have custodian risk on. I have some Bitcoin in a hot wallet, which I have a risk on. But at least I feel comfortable that that is my money. It's not somebody else's money. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And I wonder, does this aspect like of how you designed the company and by how you have reduced the, the counterparty risk, 
did this help your situation with regulations at any point? Like, were you counted as a non-custodial asset or entity? Um, it's, I mean, the thing in Switzerland, it helps you a lot in terms of, uh, if you like, if you don't have customer balances or, um, if you like, if you basically are a, what they call a digital ATM. So like literally money comes in and Bitcoin goes out. Uh, it allows you to actually do a, I mean, I would call it a KYC light where you don't explicitly have to ask, uh, for passport details or approval of residency from the customer because the Swiss regulator sees it more as a, um, a currency exchange. So let's say you go to the airport in Zurich or Geneva, you exchange a thousand Swiss francs for 900 euros. You also don't need to do a KYC then. Whereas if you do amounts higher than, I think for legacy uh, money, it's, uh, it's 5,000, then you do need to do KYC. One of the main reasons why I shut down the Dutch company was because I just felt so uncomfortable asking people for a proof of residency and proof of identity. If they're going to buy like a 25 euros worth of Bitcoin, like if you buy shoes worth 25 euro online and you would be asked for like, you know, oh, before we deliver these shoes, let's, let's ask for your passport and your, where you live, um, and prove it to us. I would feel very intimidated and I was just not comfortable doing that uh, to my users. Yeah, not just, is it rude to do such a thing, right? <laughs> and it's not comfortable for the other person. It's also a massive risk, right? All of a sudden it's you need to maintain tremendous a risk. Of, of all of these things. And as we've, as we all, we all know, you know, these trusted third party databases will be hacked and will become public yeah. knowledge. And all of a sudden the entrepreneur is kind of forced to be part of a potential hack like this, right. And to facilitate uh, the, the collection of this data and the massive risk that it entails for its customers, right. That's not a nice yeah, position to be in as an entrepreneur. No, not at all. Like we've seen it before on Binance and somewhat similar to Ledger. It's like crazy how much data just is not being treated carefully. And it's, it's just collected for the wrong reason in the first place. Right. There's, there's no exactly. need. like all my customers, they have already been KYC by a bank. They wouldn't have a bank account otherwise. So yes. like, why, why would you make it? Why would you want that data to exist in, an, in yet another place? Doesn't make sense to me. Exactly. Yeah. A big risks. So, um, then how exactly did that situation play out now, after you have established your company uh, in the Netherlands and you finally have your bank account and everything is ready, right? The, the system works, you get customers, you make up to $6 million of tr uh, euros, uh, you know, you convert, uh, into the magical cyberspace money, Bitcoin. That's a great number. Like how did that shutdown happen? What were the reasons? What changed? Um, so I, I saw the change coming, um, in like January, which was like four or five months before I looked at Switzerland and I was like, well, yeah, I could kind of keep doing what I, what I, what I'm used to do. And, um, it was just this, like, I didn't know the right people to do it with. So I just went there without knowing anyone and like got some introductions like oh maybe talk to these people talk to these people and um yeah here the, here's this lawyer and he's like yeah i can do it for you um uh, you should probably count on like 30 to fifty thousand euros to get it done oh. and i was like what are you kidding like okay that's a lot of money uh let me try this application procedure in holland and i kind of parked switzerland like that was for me like oh no that's too expensive um, obviously in hindsight, I, I, it would have been the better option, uh, because as I went into the registration process with the Dutch central bank, more and more, I was noticing like, ah, oh, this is, this is not just like about AML KYC. This is just, of, this is just about getting rid of small players. Like obviously the central bank, they prefer to deal with like a few big players and that's it. That's also what the Dutch banking landscape is like. You have six choices and that's it. There's no more banks than six. Mm -hmm. So I also talked to like two lawyers in Holland and they were like, yeah, we can do it, but it's also going to cost like 350 euros per hour and this and that. And then here I am thinking to myself, like, wait, am I working for myself 
or am I working to pay all these lawyers and people in the government to do a business? Yeah. And um, yeah, I just, I did. And then there obviously was all this stuff about the AML D5 regulations, the EU stuff that I was just very uncomfortable with. Um, Please yeah, go a bit more into those those points. Like, what were some specific new aspects in that regulation that came up in the EU? So, prior to AML D five, uh, let's say that a government or like a judicial system, uh, the police or whatever um, government institute would like, they would require data from you as a Bitcoin company. They would have to go to court and be like, make it uh, somewhat plausible to the judge that they actually need that data before you as a Bitcoin company needs to give it out. Whereas after AML D5, you as a Bitcoin company, you're just part of like the whole uh, like monitoring and whatnot systems. So that means that if a financial intelligence unit, it's it's an institute that is part of every tax authority in the EU, they somehow suspect that you're doing something wrong, they can, through a backdoor, ask like, hey, um, let's say, well, let's say Bitter was a company in Holland. They could be like, hey, Bitter, do you have any data on Max? And without me uh, being allowed to inform you as the customer, like, that the government is requesting data. I have to pass on all the records that I have on you. And no, there's no, there's, that, there's no trace of this, or there's no, you know, it doesn't go to any judge. It doesn't go to any judicial system. It just, you have to comply. And uh, yeah, this is very nasty. And I was like, I don't want to be part of this. And because uh, Bitter in Holland never got the AML D5 registration, it also doesn't apply for my historical data. But for every other player in the EU, uh, it actually does. So from from inception that they have been doing business, they they might now be re like forced into giving all customer data. Yeah, and this is also just to highlight the evils of KYC, right? It's not as the name suggests that the entrepreneur knows who his customer is, right? That's per se not the evil thing, right? In some cases, that's really necessary and useful to have. The problem yeah. is, is when the entrepreneur is forced to give over that information to a third party who has basically no business to know about these things, right? And the yeah. need to know principle here uh, is for sure uh, violated. So, but I wonder, is, is it better in Switzerland? Like, uh, do the AML D5 regulations still apply there? Uh, so AML D5 directly does not apply because Switzerland is not part of the EU. However, Switzerland is always a bit, you know, they've been on these blacklists and whatnot for like bank secrecy uh, for all these years. So now they're a bit ahead of their game and where in the rest of the world, there's like, they're only now being talked about the uh, FATF travel rule. Switzerland already has something like this. So they kind of now want to be, uh, how do you say that? Like the brightest kid in the room or whatever to show the other countries like, yeah, we're on top of this. We, we got this. Um, but there's still like some Swiss basic principles that, that, uh, are maintained. So for example, because we're not part of AML D5, we do not have to, um, you know, listen to other tax authorities. It would have to be a crime in Switzerland. People or like this foreign government would have to go to court in Switzerland to request data from our customers. Um, which I find highly unlikely, but at least if if that were the case, you're probably involved in some pretty serious criminal activities and you are aware of it as a customer because you are being taken to court or at least your name is being, you know, in the court documents. Yeah, the publicity so, is a big difference. Yeah, at least it doesn't ha happen behind your back, um, which I feel, I mean, yeah, sure, if you are, if you... Um, I don't know, uh, hired somebody for, for murder and you, I don't know, bought your Bitcoin through bidder and like for your court case, there is now some evidence required there. And this all goes through the court system. Then I have, obviously I have to cooperate with that, but at least it's like, it's out in the open. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a big difference. And so now, because 
Bitter turned into a Swiss company, um, but uh, these laws do no longer apply. But is that the case only when you work with Swiss citizens or residents or also for general people in Europe? Uh, no, for general people as well, because Swiss law applies. And if, like, say, the German tax authorities would want to have data on a German citizen, they would still have to go to a Swiss court. I see. Well, that is great. That uh, shows how difficult it is for governments to really lock down the borders and to pre to prevent this arbitrage of jurisdictions. And because now a Swiss company can easily still serve all European customers. And so in the end, all European customers will go to businesses in Switzerland and just, you know, talk to their website, which is all that they need to do. Yeah, there's some drawbacks, obviously, by being in Switzerland. So uh, I cannot, um, you know, do any marketing activities or like promote my services directly to uh, Dutch, French, Belgium, whatever people. But I have a website like people can find me. And, and I'm okay with that. Like if that's the drawback of like not being in no, or not being registered in Holland, then I'm fine with that. Yeah, that's an unfortunate trade-off and not right to do, but well, in considering everything else, right, it's still worthy to trade, to take that on. Exactly. Yes. And so like, how are you though then currently like you know, operating per se, did anything fundamentally change in the way that you do things between your time in Holland and your time now in Switzerland? There is, yes. So as I said earlier, like in Switzerland, you can do this kind of uh, Bitcoin exchange as if it's like a foreign currency exchange that you do in the airport. The only requirement that the Swiss regulator has for this is that they, you as the service provider, you need to make sure that the transaction is done after the conversion happens. So what does this mean? Uh, just like in the airport where you hand over a thousand Swiss francs and you get back 900 euros, that's it. The transaction is done. Like that money doesn't go anywhere else anymore. So uh, what they want you to avoid to do is that let's say you convert 900 euros um, with bidder and Bitter sends it to like a random Bitcoin address, um, that random Bitcoin address could be held by another exchange, let's say BitMEX. Like I, from my previous data in the Dutch company, I saw that some people were using Bitter as their kind of fiat on ramp to BitMEX. That wants, that's explicitly what the Swiss regulator wants you to avoid to do. So they came up with this scheme that um, if you, can prove that the address that you give to the service provider that you give as a customer to bidder is actually yours. Uh, you can do a transaction up to a thousand Swiss francs or 900 euros without like initially, without initiating a KYC procedure because you're mimic mimicking the uh, currency exchange, but just online. So what does that mean for the customer? Uh, in the bidder signup flow, where in the past they could just give me any Bitcoin address, they now give me a Bitcoin address, but they need to sign a message, message from that address to be able to show that they actually own the private key to that address themselves. So that's, I mean, to me, it's still, it's choosing between two evils because either I do that or I do a full KYC procedure. So to me, that's better, but it's not as nice as it used to be in Holland where you, you know, like, even if you had never used Bitcoin, all you had to do was put in a Bitcoin address and you're done. Like now it's like you need some sort of like technical knowledge to be able to do, to be able to know how to do that in your wallet, uh, signing a message. Yeah, that's very true. It's, I mean, it's always good to exclude people from coercion. So it's nice that there are people now excluded, but the way to get into that excluded group, well, that just means you need to have some technical know-how and capability, right? So average day persons are not going to be excluded here, especially in the early days where the UX of the solution is, is quite bad. Right. But yeah. on, on the other hand, like the problem I see here is that mainly this does not solve the problem that they want to seek, right? Because signing a message does not prove that the actual person here is controlling the address. It just means that any person who knows the private key and the message, right, could have produced the signature. But it doesn't have to be the person who, who you know, controls the bank account. That's right. But it's like, 
you have to choose between doing something and doing nothing. And I, I see your concern and it's very valid. But for the Swiss regulator, they were just like, well, we need to come up with some sort of way to do this. <laughs> and, and we've seen it in the, in the court case between a Dutch company called Bitonic and the central bank. Uh, the, the Dutch company fought them in court and was like, well, this, you know, it doesn't make sense and it hurts our user experience. And it's not even like a requirement by law to do this. And, and because of this last thing, they actually won the court case. Um, but in Switzerland, it definitely is a part of the uh, the regulations. But yeah, you're right. It's not it's not hundred percent satisfactory, and um, we still occasionally get some fraudulent cases. Although it has come a lot down. So what in the past with the Dutch version of Bitter used to happen quite a bit was that uh, bank accounts got hacked or people were tricked into making a payment to Bitter with a certain Bitter deposit code. And we would convert to Bitcoin and the Bitcoin would go somewhere else. That kind of fraud has decreased a lot, which actually for me as a business person, it's nice because you you don't want your platform to be used for fraud, fraudulent uh, use cases. Yeah, that's true. It makes the use for everyone worse, uh, including regular users and hackers. <laughs> yes. Great way to yeah. solve problems. <laughs> um, but you, uh, about the uh, user experience, there's like some works in the way um, by a Swiss, um, yeah, I don't know really what they are, a foundation or um, with this new type of protocol where you can like just use a, a specific URI to confirm an address and to sign the message. So, uh, so far only Blue Wallet has implemented as far as I know. But the UX there is actually quite nice. So if you use Blue Wallet with Bidder, it's you just scan a QR code. It's a bit like Ellen URL auth, and uh, and that's it. Then you're done. But yeah, I, I agree that it's 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 nasty. Like it it harms the user experience for my customers. Yeah, that's true. So let's see if more wallets adopt it. Um, I'm curious if it will ever be put into Wasabi, um, but. I mean, you know, at least uh, the something to sign a regular message naively. You know, um, there are now there is now a bit to make this for uh, Segwit and temporal transactions as well. Uh, that might probably be useful to be as a base function in the more advanced wallets. But then to have these custom protocols that are somehow required by law in some random countries. Ah, that's just a maintenance burden, right? And I, th I think opening that Pandora's box and starting down that rabbit hole is going to make it difficult. Well, I like that it's not introduced into Bitcoin itself. Like there was a an ATM company the other day that, that sent a message to the Bitcoin mailing list like, hey, can we can we add something to the uh, Bitcoin URI to to show where an address is coming from? And then I'm just like, no, like, don't don't put this stuff on Bitcoin. Did yeah. you see that or? No, I did not see that uh, specifically. But uh, I yeah I agree with the sentiment that this if it's not solving an actual problem, it should not be implemented in security critical software. No, exactly. No, for them it was like this uh, as part of this FATF travel rule. They wanted to know if you generate a Bitcoin address on Kraken then the ATM provider needs to know that. And uh, could we make that part of the payment request or whatever? And it's just like, no, don't, don't do that stuff on Bitcoin. Good luck proving a negative that Kraken does not, own, does not know a certain number. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck proving that ever. <laughs> yeah. yeah, not very useful. No, not at all. But you know, you, you managed through it. And I think that's, that's a very interesting kind of takeaway of your entire story. And it was littered with bureaucracy and inconveniences throughout, right? But you somehow continue to to stumble through and manage to pro still provide a useful service despite all the pain in the ass uh, that was caused. Uh, and that's really something to be proud of. Yeah, it was also like um, the, when I got like, let's say almost, well, a little bit more than a year ago, I was just so done with the whole thing, like shit, I had a, I had a nice running business. It was generating a nice profit. And here we are just like, 
some bureaucrats decided that I can no longer do this. And um, I was just like so done with the whole thing that I was like, I need a break. I need to do something else. And um, as time passed, I was just like, you know, I actually, I miss it because I, like a lot of people were asking like, well, but like, can't you come back? And like, we really miss your service. And, and also to me, it was like this kind of, you know, this sense of purpose, you know, like I'm actually providing a valuable service to the world that uh, I, I missed it. And I was like, just, I guess, more uh, committed to, to actually seeking a solution. Whereas before I was more in the despair phase, like, oh, I don't want to do this anymore. Yeah, the entrepreneurial spirit is difficult to keep down for long, right? Just <laughs> exactly. solving problems for others is a very exhilarating thing to do. Yeah, that's right. Nice, nice. Well, I'm happy that you came back eventually, uh, but let's dive a bit more down into where you spent your time on during that, where you were kind of off the business of Bitter. Uh, where did you end up spending your time then? Yeah, uh, so I started off with a fun project in my parents' backyard. I built a sauna from scratch. I, I like to work with my hands sometimes, and it was for me a great way to spend six weeks doing nothing but building stuff in the physical world with wood and and like all kinds of materials. So that was a great way to kind of reset and, and take my mind off, off bitter things. Yeah, that's and, smart uh, yeah, to be in meat space manifesting something. Uh, exactly, yes. That's a good hedge against the volatility of Bitcoin. <laughs> and I don't mean the price, I mean the craziness in the rabbit hole. Yeah, exactly. And just for uh, yeah, good good four weeks. I was also barely on Bitcoin Twitter at that time. I was just like just kind of staying to myself and like enjoying the time outside. Um, but I did... Um, like one of my friends here in Holland, uh, his name is Leon, and he just started an, another Bitcoin company called Stacking. And uh, we were like, occasionally we were in touch with each other to kind of discuss things, uh, help each other out where necessary. And um, yeah, I think um, because I shut down Bitter, he kind of reached out to me like, hey, like, don't you want to join Stacking and, and, and work on Stacking as well? And I, um, I was like, yeah, because that initially when I started Bitter, I wanted to kind of become this uh, Acorns app that we talked about all the way in the beginning, um, which they, besides the dollar cost averaging, they, they, they do a lot more, uh, giving rewards for signing up with some of their partners and then giving you money into your investment account. And I was like, oh, I want to do that kind of stuff with Bitter too, eventually. and. Um, Stacking does exactly that. So you're being rewarded for using partners that have uh, that are working with stacking. And instead of that reward being like, you know, some euros or whatever fiat currency, uh, stacking actually pays it out in Bitcoin. So let's say uh, you book a hotel with booking.com, then 1% uh, of whatever you spent on that hotel, you'll actually get back uh, after you've stayed uh, in Satoshi's. So I was like, well, this is this nice match of like stuff that I wanted to do anyways at some point, but stacking is already doing. And um, yeah, then I then I joined Leon. Yeah, interesting. So these Sandspec strategies are again already work in the existing fiat system. And so why not apply the same concept? Right? This is a great way for the uh, um, you know merchant to get new customers. And for the affiliates to get paid, right? So yeah. that's, uh, why not? It works. So let's apply to Bitcoin. What were your kind of roles in contributing there? Um, so I do most of the operational stuff um, in terms of like, uh, for example, when I joined, there was like no uh, support system. So Leon was just like, you know, being on Telegram, talking to, uh, users one-to-one -one, uh, or re replying to some emails and uh, there's also this notion of like when people use stacking um, there there's this registration happening of a click so that the merchant knows that this customer is actually coming from stacking and from time to time this tracking just 
gets lost in the way. Like maybe people have a pie hole or an ad blocker or some other VPN service that blocks the domain or IP addresses of these tracking services. And um, then people can file a claim to be like, hey, I actually spent money with this merchant. I came through stacking, but I didn't get any sets back. Uh, can you like take a look at this? So for all this stuff, there was like no support system. So I went out there, kind of searched for uh, like, you know, what are alternatives to Zendesk? Because I used to use Zendesk in Bitter and I was like, I want to um, use open source stuff. And there's actually a really great tool called um, Zamat. And it's, it's, um, it's basically an open source version of uh, Zendesk, this customer support system. Yeah, that's actually so, quite an interesting software. By the way, there's a cool Nextcloud plugin uh, for that as well. Um, what does it do? Uh, oh, it's just an integration uh, so that you get notifications and stuff in Nextcloud, and it works well with the files that you have hosted there. Um, but yeah. the, to the name, it's actually pronounced Zamat, which is a German Bavarian way of saying together. Uh, so Zamat. Ah, Zamat. Mm -hmm. Zamat. Thanks. I didn't know. I, I never knew where the name come, came from. Okay, so that's cool. So you're you're doing more of the operational side again, you know, that what you basically did with Bitter uh, as well, right? Not as much of the yeah. tech stuff, but more of, yeah. you know, building the business and everything but code, basically. Yeah. But here we are, um, that also in uh, stacking, um, I saw a problem and I was kind of annoyed that whatever, whenever I had to look up customers' data stuff, I would have to, you know, go into the database and do my queries. And I was like, you know, there must be a better way. Um, so then um, for stacking, we use uh, PHP Laravel. And there's this admin uh, toolkit called uh, Laravel Nova. And because Leon was obviously busy, busy building, uh, like, the stacking website and the partnerships with, like, affiliate networks and all these integrations, um, he didn't have time to uh, to build this like kind of admin dashboard for stacking. So then I was like, well, that could be a nice project for me. It's like it's quite separated from the rest of the stacking code. Um, so let me take on that. And um, yeah, like now I have a customer support system which works really well. I have a admin dashboard for stacking where I can look up stuff for for the stacking customers. So it's like, yeah. As you see a problem and you want to fix it by writing code, and and that's what I like doing. That's that's really interesting. Cool. So you, you know, you have no experience with coding like that before, but then you have an actual problem. You want to fix it, right? So there's the the motivation there already, and then also the drive to do it yourself, right? Yeah. What were the the kind of steps or the mindset that you took on with then ultimately? trying to find a solution to something that you have basically no idea about. So before I wrote that code for stacking, I was also, uh, um, it was kind of weird actually, because with Bitter, I shut it down, it was done. But I had this urge to be like, well, there's all this code and I want to do something with it. Um, like I want to be able to extend and potentially like open source it at that time. Um, so I want to be able to write on this project myself and the whole backend of, uh, of Bitter is written in Elixir. So I started doing these uh, online courses in Elixir and yeah, after, I mean, it takes a while, but the thing is you need to have some sort of uh, desire or like an urge to actually go do something with the code. Because just doing a coding course doesn't get you anywhere, I would say. Like, it's good for getting the basics, but then you need to actually have a problem that you want to solve um, to be able to apply the knowledge that you learn in the course. So for me, that was uh, building an admin panel for Bitter. Uh, that was also something I never had. And it also, yeah, it was just always on our backlog. Like, yeah, one day we'll do it. And I was like, yeah, this is a nice project that I can do myself if only I knew how to write Elixir code. And after going through that process, I was like, well, you know, it's it's all it's it's the in hindsight problem. Like it, 
when you do the whole thing, it's like, oh, this wasn't that hard. And, and that's how I got to the stacking problem as well. Like, oh, I've never done any PHP code, but let me just get started. And I, I took some course on like this, this PHP Laravel Nova. And yeah, after a while, because you have the actual urgency to solve a problem, you just get it done. Yeah, that's great. Um, and you know, one way to get it done is again, to somehow beg other people to write it for you. But yeah, that's always tricky to wait for others, right? And to be a bit more self-reliant and self-sufficient yeah, and doing it uh, yourself is the way to go. Like now in hindsight, was it worth it spending all the time and effort to learning this new skill? Oh, definitely. I would, I wish I did it 10 years ago. Like this, this was so much more valuable than my whole college education. Like there's, um, there's a few, I mean, as much as I liked my university time and like I studied abroad a lot and it was, it was really fun, but in terms of knowledge, um, if I would have read, uh, Atlas Shrugged, the Bitcoin standard, uh, all the kids books for like the total twins, uh, sovereign individual, like that would have been like such a better use case of time compared to a college degree. And then I wish I knew that t 10 years ago. But hey, you got a piece of paper. That's useful. Right? <laughs> Completely useless if you're an entrepreneur, because nobody will ever ask for it. <laughs> no, you actually have to do the work for real. Yep. Yes. Oh, so annoying. So annoying. <laughs> okay. So that's, that's very interesting. And were there any other kind of projects other than building these dashboards that you were looking into originally when coding? Um, well, I had some like, you know, like smaller issues on bitter that I, um, had to tackle, but they were not that exciting. Like for example, uh, now that bitter is based in Switzerland, um, and my bank is in Germany, then I need, needed to add support in bitter for that new bank. Um, so I wrote that, that piece of code, but it's, it's a bit boring. <laughs> Um, the other cool thing, uh, or a nice project and where, uh, stacking and bitter gets, gets nicely together is that, um, I always wanted to have an affiliate system in bitter. So like, let's say, I mean, if you recommend bitter to your friends and family, that's great. But I, I would also want to in, like, uh, to reward you for that. And so I thought like, well, I could either build this myself or just work with stacking because that's basically what they do. They reward people. So why don't we work together? And, um, yeah, that was a, a, a really cool integration between the two platforms. So now when you, uh, like you sign up, well, obviously you need a stacking account, but then on, on stacking, there's a bidder page. And if you, if you share that link, uh, specifically with your friends and family, then bidder knows like, oh, this is a user that came through stacking. Uh, let's put some sets back in his account there. And it's just like, you know, if, if I were to be reliant on other people, this would take ages. And, and in our case, Leon and I, we just sat together for two weeks and we got it done. Like that's just yeah, the most great. rewarding thing. Yeah. Well, that's, that's awesome. Right. And, uh, it, I guess also opens up a, a vast marketing opportunity for you, right? Not just do you, uh, did you have a really quick turnaround with building the thing? But now also this is, I think, a really fast way of, of scaling the well, advertisement and the good word to mouth. Yeah, exactly. For sure. Uh, very interesting. What, what's the percentage of, of affiliation uh, bonus that the person gets? Um, so we don't work with a percentage because, um, like I thought about, uh, who was it that first did this, um. Uh... Maybe it was the guys from CoinFloor that reached out to me after Bitter shut down. Like, hey, don't you want to send your users a um, uh, a, a CoinFloor link so that they that you get like a affiliate commission and whatever? And I saw that it was like based on a percentage, and I got thinking to myself like, that's okay if it's like a large scale platform and you don't really know who you give your affiliate link to, but if you just like let's say you are a bidder user and you give your link to your, I don't know, like some, you only give it to one friend. And then at some point you get a reward that is like, I don't know, uh, 
uh, like 10,000 Satoshis. And you know that that reward is like 0.5% of whatever the commission was, then you would know exactly how much they're stacking. And I'm like, that just, it kind of feels wrong, like giving that information away. Um, yeah, that's I don't a think... great point for privacy, actually. And that if I you don't... have a flat 1% fee and you get, you know, $1, then you know that the guy bought $100 worth of Bitcoin. Exactly. And I, I think, well, maybe other platforms have considered it, but I think it's a bit tricky to do it that way. Um, and also, um, a affiliate system, it's, it's designed to attract new users, right? Uh, it's like you, uh, you reward the person that uh, is bringing you a new user with, with some money or other ways. And then after that moment that the user is rewarded, it's up to you as a business to serve the customer well to keep them happy. So I also don't really see uh, why in an affiliate system for like recurring revenue that you would keep paying the original referrer for every transaction in the future. Well, I guess uh, the rationale here is that when you when the person continuously keeps buying Bitcoin, then he is a more valuable person for that uh, business, and therefore the you know affiliation payout might be proportionally or at least somewhat proportionally larger as well. Yeah, well, I, I, yeah, I still think that, like you're right, but I still think that uh, it's ultimately up to better than to keep the user happy and to keep using the platform. But yeah, yeah a, I guess no, there's a trade-off. That's a great point and it's, it's a trade-off, right? But ultimately, I mean, just the fact that you pay people to do, uh, you know, the word to mouth, is great and that's uh, a gratuitous gift so to say for from bitter right? and then there's no obligation that you do this in the first place and so no. a, any stat that you give is amazing basically yeah so in the end we i think we settled on a uh two euro referral payout obviously paid out in sets um for referring a new user um but there is one thing where to me the uh percentage thing does make sense and also to keep paying it out and that is actually with wallet providers so um, i think in general uh, building a wallet is is kind of a bad business model in the sense that you uh, you build it uh, as a hardware wallet manufacturer you sell it once and then you have to keep supporting it forever but you don't get any additional revenue so in this case i would actually want uh, Bitter to be a revenue model for hardware wallet manufacturers where they do get a percentage and they do get, keep getting it forever just to make the wallet industry uh, like a bit more sustainable. Yeah, I see. Uh, that, and that is for sure a big difficult problem, right? And to convince people on a continuous basis to part with their precious Satoshis is a very difficult thing. And <laughs> let alone once, but doing it all the time. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, in this case with wallets, I'm okay with it. Like if I think of, I mean, there's, I hope that Trezor is doing great at the moment, but there was this time in uh, like a Baltic Honey Badger conference a few years ago, and they, they were mentioning this issue like, yeah, hey, we sell these devices once, but then we never see any money for them again. So we need to seek additional revenue streams. And I think that the platforms that, uh, that do like dollar cost averaging and have some sort of integration with the hardware wallet i think that could be a great avenue for them yeah that's a that's a great point right and again it's just a lot of financial services in the space someone's got to fill uh fulfill them right yeah yeah and i'm uh at some point i i was thinking from this acorn strategy like oh let me let me do like an app so that to make it even more easy but then I was like, oh, you know, like I, I, I've never built a Bitcoin wallet and there's so many great wallets out there already. Like, why would I go through the issue or like the burden of doing it myself? It's, it's an, it's another like, uh, like huge responsibility. That is very so, true. And in general, I much agree, but I think that in the future, we might still see a lot of new wallets popping up just because we have better library infrastructure. And like, for example, yeah. the Rust Bitcoin and Rust Lightning libraries make it almost trivial to build a new user interface 
with some new magic under the hood as well uh, that just does all the lightning stuff out of the box. Yeah, yeah. So once that's like widely available, then I would probably like if I know that on the technical side, I don't really need to do anything or like just integrating a library, then I would also consider building an app. But I really don't want to do the heavy heavy lifting myself. For sure, for sure. No, I totally get that. Building a, a good wallet is a behemoth project. Yeah, as you know best. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Damn, where did the last years go? <laughs> oh, yeah. So I, I, I just want to highlight uh, on the functional side, right? Because I don't think we talked about this yet. That in the past, at least, uh, the user provided you their XPub. Right? And uh, then you could generate new addresses, unused addresses for every single payment uh, that were made. Right. So the beautiful yeah. thing here, then, of course, on the public blockchain, there is no address reuse, right? meaning that each user transaction has a new address. But of course, still with the downside that you at least know that all of these addresses belong to the same person because you have the XPUB. Like yes. what? What were some of the trade-offs and your decision-making process in this regard back in the time? Uh, it's a it is a trade-off, and it's neither situation is ideal. Um, so, although I could understand why many people wanted the functionality, it to me I would feel a bit as a user I would feel quite uncomfortable giving an XPUB because not only are they able to see all my prior transactions but they would also be able to see any transaction I do in the future from that particular account so I'm not sure if I would as an end user if I would prefer to uh, give an XPUB or just use a single address but have that you know make hopefully be a Wasabi uh, address and then coin join it whenever possible. I feel like from a privacy perspective, that would actually be the preferred option, even though that would, uh, even though there would be then address reuse. Uh, however, because some, so many people asked for the expert functionality, I, I did create it and my only uh, way to mitigate this this issue of seeing all the prior transactions and future uh, transactions um, was that I would be for you could continue in the sign up process. I would check if that uh, XPUB was ever used in the past. And if it, I mean, I wouldn't, obviously, I wouldn't save the XPUB at that point. But if the uh, XPUB would be used, the user could not continue the sign up process. So I was basically forcing people to create a separate account that would only be hopefully only be used with Bitter. I mean, obviously I have no way of uh, stopping the user after they've done the check to then go use that expo with other services as well. But at least I tried my best to, for people to not give wallets that, you know, they might have been used for 10 years and then they share their entire history with Bitter that, that I would always want to avoid and was yeah. actually forcing on the user. Yeah. I, I think that this is the main attack vector, right? That or the main problem you know, on the privacy level, that someone uses an old XPUB that has, you know, his his life savings and many hundreds of thousands of transactions in the past. Right? That that would be bad. But as long yeah. as you generate a new XPUB, right, or at least an account uh, within a wallet, um, then I think this is really a smart way to do it because it's it's better, I think, in any case because if you reuse addresses. Well, the exchange, of course, knows that one user account has the same address, right? So he knows that this goes to the same user account completely off chain, right? But the yeah. blockchain itself has this uh, address reuse problem and the common ownership heuristic analysis as well, right? Yeah. While with an XPUB, sure, the exchange still knows that, that this is your XPUB and then that all of these addresses belong to you. That's the same as before, right? But at least yeah. uh, the outside observer have less information about you and that's a net win so i think that this was a, a really smart choice uh, given the trade-offs yeah we're actually um working together with the guys from pocket bitcoin to bring this functionality back um because now in this swiss entity people need to sign a message uh with their with like from a specific bitcoin address so i was like oh that kind of scraps the expert feature 
But then soon after I launched, some people actually reached out to me like, hey, did you know that if you have one XPUB and you have the um, private key of the first or any address in the XPUB and you know the path, you can actually calculate every other private key. So that means that if you own the first address in an XPUB, you actually own the entire XPUB. So that to me was new. And I was like, oh, actually this gives up an opportunity to use the signing stuff, but still be able to deliver on the XPUB functionality. So now we made it our common job for Pocket and, and Bitter to explain this to the regulator and be like, well, this is cryptographically sound and people that even though they only sign from one address in the expo, they actually do own the entire expo. So we should be able to pay out to a new address every time. But yeah. um, this is uh, dealing with the regulator and that's not going quick. <laughs> You know, this is the point that probably pisses me off most about the regulator here in this scenario, that they are really forcing or, or encouraging a privacy best worst practice uh, in, in the ecosystem, right? That is clearly against industry standards defined, you know, since 2009, we know that address reuse is a bad idea, but this yeah. law encourages it, right? And therefore risks users and puts them actually at harm, even though every expert says that this is not a good idea to do. Right. So that and they just probably shows... have no idea that, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. It, it just shows that they have no idea, right? They have no idea what they're doing and are at best, um, um, uh, like ignorant, but at worst malicious. I, from my interaction so far, I think it's ignorance. Like they don't have, they don't see why it's bad. So like, that's part of our, like pocket and bidders proposal is the first two pages are explaining why it is even bad because probably like. I mean, in Switzerland, it's not like you talk directly to the regulator, but there's all these self-regulated organizations that they grant you the right to do business um, or the permission, I should say. And so it's them that you need to explain this, like, hey, uh, look, it's, compli it's compliant with Swiss law and this is how it works. Um, but yeah, they're, they're not used to Bitcoin. Yeah. Uh, it's a shame, the political activism, uh, it wastes a lot of time that could have been spent elsewhere. But well, yeah. uh, thank you for the sacrifice that you do so <laughs> that other people don't have to. Yeah, and it's the, uh, it's the exact same with lightning payments. So uh, uh, Bitter has been ready for lightning even before we shut down, but we uh, rely on Keysend or another version of Keysend to, to be widely available to use our kind of method because we don't want to custody people's Bitcoin. So we cannot really do um, LN URL withdrawals. Uh, we always want to be able to send Bitcoin as it has to be paid out right away to somebody's node. So we use Keysend for that. And it's been ready and it's like my node is up and running and it's just waiting there because um, we don't have the like regulatory approval to do lightning payments. and. Another Bitcoin company in Switzerland, Bitcoin Swiss, has been, you know, trying to get this done for ages and they're just not getting it done. And it's not because of them. It's because of the regulator. Yeah. Yeah. Yet another proof. It's very annoying. It's, it's super annoying, right? And it, it just hinders innovation on such a drastic, huge, huge, like humongous level. And we just notice it now because we're in the Bitcoin space. But this is the problem basically everywhere for entrepreneurs, that there are bureaucrats in your way, making it very difficult, if not impossible, to provide a useful service to your customers. It's a sad state of affair. Yeah, very much so. But I'm like, uh, I'm very glad that now, um, at least with the guys from Pocket, uh, it's nice to not be alone in this. Like you all kind of have this common goal, like you all want people to stack sets, you all want them to do it in the best way. And it's nice to like be able to, to collaborate instead of like compete, like, yeah. Yeah. That's very interesting, right? Because as this is a, a very comp or it, it seems to be a very competitive business, right? With numerous different alternatives, uh, on, on many aspects, right? Uh, but maybe, or wh why do you think that it is that there's still such a large corporation and kind of seeking for a common good? Well, we have, we all have the same goal. So we all want the Bitcoin standard. 
And to me, it doesn't really matter how we get there as long as we get there. And I feel like that might be different from like traditional industries where like, um, I don't know, you would despise your competitors or whatnot. Like I, I don't feel this, this kind of, um, uh, competition between Bitcoin companies. Yeah, it's at, at least not a nasty competition, right? Um, no. what, are some, what are some of the things other than the regulatory hurdles, but what are some other things that you guys are collaborating with or kind of sharing notes? Uh, for now, it's only the regulatory stuff. Uh, but like, I mean, for example, what are things like, you know, UX or uh, other? Um, well, we like, yeah, that's a good point, but we don't really share stuff on on, on any other aspect than... Um, than the regulatory stuff. Like the other day, actually, somebody in our Telegram group asked if, uh, like, these Bitcoin companies were like sharing data with each other to because there's this limit of people being allowed to do a thousand euro or a thousand Swiss francs, sorry, uh, per day. And this user was asking, like, do you share data with Pocket to see if we're not like you know, buying a thousand Swiss francs here and a thousand Swiss francs there. And I'm like, no, of course we don't share data. Like, <laughs> it's a bit funny. Yeah. So, yeah, you can use all of us to, uh, to max it out to the fullest. Yeah. But by the way, I'm actually thinking that this might be enforced in one of the next waves uh, because these smurfing attacks, so to say, uh, or they call it like that, uh, to make a large payment in multiple smaller transactions, um, they are even checked across banks um in in some way in, in the fiat system so i'm guessing that eventually you will actually have to refer to the other uh, available or regulated exchanges to make sure that the user has not bought more than a thousand francs all over the place don't tell them yeah yeah <laughs> let's stay quiet about that one <laughs> if only they knew <laughs> yeah it's it's going to be fun to see how this evolves, but it's great that you find an escape pod in Switzerland and that at least for now, uh, you have figured out how to take care of the bureaucracy in the least annoying or troublesome way. Uh, and hopefully this can be improved in the, in the future or at least not reduced, which is the more likely trend as with all regulation. Yeah, I really hope so. Because, um, I mean, I... I don't ever want to offer a service that I would not personally feel comfortable with using. So it got it got to that point with doing bitter in Holland under the new regulations. And I I mean that's knock on wood that this doesn't happen, but I I feel like if Switzerland stays the way it is and it's like, yeah, we're compliant, but we have our own little quirks. Then, then I, I actually hope that we can keep doing this kind of bidder service for like a really long time um, before Switzerland is forced into from like international pressure pressures to uh, to to stop it. Yeah, and then when it gets shut down, by that time we have numerous Bitcoin citadels up and running that can securely yes. host your servers. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, two weeks, true. right? Two weeks, exactly. Two weeks. <laughs> Well, Ruben, it was a pleasure chatting with you so far. Uh, is there anything final that you would like to bring up? Uh, thanks for having me. Um, well, no, just uh, following Metodel's advice. Stay humble, stack sets. Exactly. Yes. And get better is really one of the best places to do that. Uh, earned reputation uh, in, you know, the already back uh, in the last bear market, uh, but now after a period of learning how to code, uh, coming back strong with some regulatory arbitrage, moving to different jurisdictions to provide still the valuable shitcoin waste disposal facility uh, that is so useful for, for the Bitcoiners who still are hodling onto their fiat, uh, which I find very absurd. Uh, like, yeah, but people still have fiat jobs. They get fiat into their bank account. So if they allocate a certain percentage of that fiat income every month and it goes straight to bidder they're 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 doing their part no no that's that's very true that's very true but you could be missing out guys uh, like i uh, you know earn everything in bitcoin and then selectively jump into the fiat shitcoin pool 
that's uh that's nicer that's nicer but in in the meantime uh like for everyone but myself basically <laughs> bitter <laughs> is great but it it, it, I, it sucks because i never got to use it uh, because you started after i got rid of the shit coins so that, that oh. was always a shame yeah you really don't want to get a bank account just for this purpose so no. uh, when we, the next time we meet in real life i'll show you how it worked with my shit coin bank account <laughs> yeah yeah that's a shame i would i would love to be using bitter it's awesome but i can't um it's a shame it's for a good reason that you can't yeah it's yeah. okay yep very true very true but actually, actually it's not okay it's great yeah yeah that's true that's true it would actually be cool to have somewhat of a similar service uh the other way around too and that you always get paid uh you know a fixed amount of bitcoin and then you receive a variable amount of fiat uh, in exchange afterwards, you know, just to cover a little bit of your expenses. That might be interesting. Hmm. That could be. That it could have been done on the bidder in Holland, but um, from all my uh, six million euros in volume, there was twelve hundred euros the other way. So I was like, I'm just not going to be bothered keeping up that infrastructure in my website and have the really? liability there. Because nobody ever uses it. That's so now it's a bit funny. On Bitter, it's just a one way stream. It's just fiat <laughs> in, Bitcoin goes out. There's no way back. It's designed to pump forever. Right? There, <laughs> yes. there is no sell button. <laughs> there is no sell button. <laughs> Oh, you know, for, for an outside observer, that sounds dangerously close to a Ponzi scheme. No, no, <laughs> you, you can only buy it. It's, it's great. Just give me all your money. <laughs> Oh, yeah. No, but you know, I think it's great. Stay focused uh, on the important thing, and that's being a shitcoin disposal facility. You know, uh, taking like the garbage out. Who would do that? You know, beautiful entrepreneurs yeah. like you. <laughs> so that's that's yes. awesome. Nice. Thanks very much for having me. Well, for sure, it was a pleasure to to catch up and talk again. Uh, and you know, Piers, look look into the YouTube and podcast archives. You will see numerous shows with Ruben over the last couple of years where we actually went through this entire story as it was in, unfolding in real time. Uh, so it's, yeah. it's great to now get the next epoch of Bitter on record. I'm happy that we did right. it, Ruben. That's nice that we have this history. <laughs> right, it is. Okay, All right, I hope to see you soon in, uh, in real life somewhere, in the Bitcoin conference. Yes, yes, it has to be coming. If those soon. ever happen again. Yeah, yeah, let's see if we're allowed to. Uh, if not, I'm sure we will meet uh, in any case. <laughs> we will. Cool. Have a great day and I'll see you soon. Yes. Thank you, Piers, for joining us here at the Wazabikas, uh, a Bitcoin privacy podcast. Boost the show and all the other awesome Bitcoin podcasts out there with a new podcasting app.com. Uh, and see you guys on the next one. Bye bye.